I am Dr. Frank Patterson. I'm going to be talking to you guys tonight about brain injury and a personal approach to care. So, a little bit about myself. I'm a licensed chiropractor. I'm board certified in chiropractic neurology. I have a fellowship in mild traumatic brain injury, and I joined the, the Georgia Chiropractic Neurology Center in February of 2023. So, I in here, in, interned here at GCNC in 2014. Um, and it's really good to be back. So we're going to try and keep things a little bit loose tonight. I'm going to go through our PowerPoint together. But um, if anybody has any questions at any time, we have somebody manning the chat, and we can get those questions answered. So we can definitely make this evening dynamic. Um, but let's get into the PowerPoint a little bit, and let's get into what we're talking about. So what is uh, Georgia Chiropractic Neurology Center? Chiropractors specializing in multi multidisciplinary neurorehabilitation. So what is that exactly does that mean? We harness the brain's ability to change and adapt neuroplast uh, change and adapt, which is also known as neuroplasticity. So we're trying to restore function, and once we restore function to the brain, then people's symptoms tend to get better. So our topics for tonight. What is brain injury? Oh, it looks like I'm not progressing on the slides. I apologize. So let's try this again. There we go. What is brain injury? Okay. What are the types of brain injury? How is a brain injury typically treated? How is GCNC, uh, how is our approach, how we approach your, <laughs> how GCNC approaches your brain injury differently? I can't talk tonight, apparently. So with that, we're going to talk about why balance matters to your brain function, and then we're going to go through some patient stories as well. And then we'll have time at the end for questions. So I appreciate everybody bearing with us. You'll, you're seeing tonight that we do have like some technical difficulties going on. Uh, just be aware that this is our first YouTube live stream. So bear with us. We're going to be doing this hopefully on a monthly basis. So the quality of these is just going to keep getting better and better. But let's keep going. So what is a brain injury? It's a structural, chemical, and functional disruption to brain function. All right, and there's two major categories of brain injury that we're gonna get into, but let's talk a little bit about epidemiology and some statistics. So it's been estimated that 214,110 TBI-related hospitalizations took place in 2020, which is quite a lot. And interestingly enough, you know, a lot of times we think of, of, a, of a brain injury, we might think of something like a concussion and we know that there's a lot of young people out there that are involved with, uh, with sports, you know, and there's all kinds of professional athletes. You would think there'd be a tremendous amount of concussions, but at least as far as when it comes to the severity where we need hospitalization, it's primarily people that are 75 and older, right? They're having the highest rates of TBI-related hospitalization and deaths. And what, what do you think's behind that? Does anybody have any ideas why we're getting so many TBI um, hospitalizations and death at that age range? Um, it's due to falls. It's due to falls. So balance matters, though, not just with people that are 75 plus. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to accomplish tonight was I wanted to talk a little bit about balance in general, because we have some people that come in for balance complaints. Um, and then we have a lot of people where balance isn't really a concern of theirs, but it's a really good reflection of how your brain functions. And it can direct us in what areas of your brain need help. And then it can also direct us as far as what therapies we need to do. And we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of that a little bit. But it's interesting that balance is really tied into TBIs, right? Because the age range that is most affected by TBI hospitalizations, right? Is those people in the 75 plus range. Okay, so there's two major types of brain injury. All right, so the first type is acquired. There's a little bit of controversy in the terminology because some people say that the broad overarching category, right, of brain injury that includes both a non-traumatic brain injury and traumatic is acquired. And then we have an acquired brain injury, meaning that it's after birth. Okay, so an acquired brain injury, some people say that that's the major category. And then it's split between a non-traumatic and a traumatic brain injury. But then you look at other sources and it talks about an acquired brain injury being the same thing as a non-traumatic brain injury. However, that's pretty much semantics, but it's just something to be aware of. 
So let's talk about these non-traumatic acquired brain injuries. So when we look at traumatic versus non-traumatic, our major factors that are at play here is a non-traumatic brain injury, it's attributed to internal factors. Whereas a traumatic brain injury, it's damage from external factors. So what exactly does that mean? So with a traumatic brain injury, it occurs when an external force causes a hit to the head with a rapid stop or start motion, right? Typically, when we think of a traumatic brain injury, we think that somebody hit their head. But I highlighted that there's a rapid start and stop motion because you don't have to hit your head to get a traumatic brain injury. You don't have to hit your head to get a concussion. You also don't have to lose consciousness to get a concussion. Right? We'll talk about that in a little bit, but let's talk about non-traumatic brain injuries, AKA acquired brain injuries, depending upon your terminology. So it's damage to the brain due to internal factors. So we're looking at things like um, stroke, right? Which is, falls under the category of lack of oxygen, okay? So we could have a stroke, and then I have a picture up here um, and I apologize to the people pointing off to the side, but we have people that are here alive with us and they can see the projector over here. But as far as what you can see on the PowerPoint at home, we have two categories of stroke. We have a hemorrhagic stroke and then we have an ischemic stroke. And I wanna talk a little bit more about stroke, uh, stroke tonight as well, um, because that's one that can be kind of silent and kind of come out of nowhere and sneak up on people. So it's a really important one to know what to look out for, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But we should also know what type of strokes we're looking at. So a hemorrhagic stroke is when there's a rupture of a blood vessel, and then an ischemic stroke, there's a clogging of the, of the uh, blood vessel. So I like to think of it as far as plumbing. You either have a burst pipe, and that's a hemorrhagic stroke, or you have an ischemic stroke, or a clogged pipe. Right, so clogged pipe versus burst, burst pipe, either way you're not getting water flow, or in the case of in our brain, we're not getting proper blood flow to the areas that we need. And kind of similar um, to plumbing as well, like there's a certain level of more urgency, right, as far as getting care when we have a hemorrhagic stroke, right, when we're leaking that blood in our brain. So you can also have a lack of oxygen though be due to a near drowning incident overdose, carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, you can also have issues with exposure to toxins, right? Whether it be alcohol, heavy metals, pesticides, or has anybody ever heard of the term chemo brain? Some people are familiar with that, some people aren't. Um, it's just the reality of the situation where some people, when they, they go through chemotherapy for cancer, they actually get a type of chemical brain injury. It also happens to people at, at times as well when they go under anesthesia for a surgery. It hits different people harder than others, and it can present almost as if, you know, there's, it, it's a type of brain injury. So it can present like other types of brain injury, essentially. Um, and then there's also uh, acquired brain injuries that can happen due to diseases such as meningitis, right, that causes, um, an infection in the brain comes from a bacteria and that can cause a lot of inflammation and other major issues, right? And then there's also pressure that can come from a, a tumor or a brain an aneurysm, which is a bulging of a blood vessel in the brain. And either way, it creates pressure, which can have a negative effect on the brain. So like I was talking about before, I wanted to, to talk a little bit more about strokes, right? So there's signs of strokes. So, the things we want to look out for to know if we're potentially having a stroke is dizziness, vision changes. So that could be like double vision or just really blurry vision. Things that are called drop attacks where you, you kind of suddenly fall and nearly or lose consciousness. Um, there's also poor coordination issues. That could be with how you move your limbs, uh, meaning your upper limbs, or it could be how you're walking as well. Um, there's also headache, difficulty swallowing, difficulty speaking, nausea, numbness, and what's called nystagmus, which is beating back and forth of your eyes. But kind of an easier um, way to look at things is when it comes to stroke, there's the be fast uh, way to look at it. So that's um, balance is unsteady, eyes are blurry, right? Your face is drooping, which wasn't in those other categories that we discussed, but you can look for a drooping face, you can look for arm weakness, 
You can look for speech difficulties, and at that point, it's time to call 911. We wanna take strokes very seriously, right? Because we wanna A, have enough time to get to the hospital, right, to get this taken care of, but part of that is that we also wanna give the hospital enough time to be able to figure out what's going on, right? And when, when we go to the hospital, one of the first things they're gonna do is they're gonna do imaging of you, and they're gonna do a CT scan, most likely, um, and they're gonna do that because it's quick and they wanna figure out very quickly whether you're having a hemorrhagic stroke where the pipe burst or they wanna figure out whether you had an, have an ischemic stroke where you've got a clog in the plumbing, right? Because they treat those two things very differently and it's very important to know which one you're dealing with. All right, so then before we get into traumatic brain injury, I actually wanna take a step back for a second. I wanna tell you a little bit of a story about stroke. I talked about you know, how you see these signs and then someone winds up going to the hospital. So you know, what our approach to care with patients, we're not a hospital setting. You could look at us as an out, outpatient rehab facility. Um, so that being said though, we have patients that come through our clinic that have these complaints. We'll have patients that come and they have dizziness and they have dizziness and vision changes, right? And they have a headache, right? And they're nauseous. That could also just be like vertigo. So part of our intake process, one of the first things we do is we're gonna look at that person and we're gonna check their vitals. We've had patients where they've showed up into our office and they were actively having a stroke, right? So we take this very seriously in our office. We are not the place for them but it's something that we're vigilant and we're constantly looking out for. And then, you know, naturally we sent them to the emergency room right away. So it's a very important thing to, to take these symptoms serious. I don't wanna scare anyone, right? But if you're seeing these B fast signs, you need to get them to the hospital. And we've done it several times here, honestly. So let's talk about traumatic brain injury, all right? So a traumatic brain injury, we get damage to the brain from external factors, okay? And this occurs, like I said before, when there's an external force and it causes a hit to the head or a rapid stop or start motion. And this can lead to things like contusions, which are like a bruising of the brain, diffuse axonal injury, which is a shearing of the brain, where it, it stretches the neurons, right, the cells in the brain, and sometimes it tears through them and that's a diffuse axonal injury. There's also a penetrating injury, and that's where you can get, have a stab wound or a bone fragment to the head. That's a pretty serious injury as well. And then there's a concussion, which is a mild traumatic brain injury. And the name is a little bit misleading. Honestly, we've, we've had a lot of patients that have had concussions, and it's, at times it's a little bit insulting to call it a mild traumatic brain injury. It's considered mild because the vast majority of the time when you have a concussion, Fortunately, you look at your imaging and it looks pretty clean. That being said, when I'm talking about imaging, I'm talking about an MRI. So let's talk about MRI versus a CT scan. Both of those can be taken of your head. I said when you have a stroke, they're most likely going to take a CT scan. In a way, a better thing to get is an MRI because it looks better at soft tissue. A CT scan is better set up for looking at hard tissue like bone. So then why would they look at hard tissue when they think you're having a stroke that's affecting the soft tissue in your brain, why would they do that CT scan? Because it's quick. An MRI takes time, it gets a better view of the brain, but it takes too much time. We don't have that much time. So oftentimes they'll just start with a CT scan. We've had some people in the brain injury community where they're upset because they just did the CT scan and they didn't follow up with an MRI. And I would argue at that point, if you're out of that crisis stage, like if you've had a brain injury, like you deserve an MRI, not just the CT scan. But in that initial, you know, life-saving stage, it's very important. But like I said, with concussion, it's probably not going to show up in either. There's another type of imaging where they take an MRI and then they um, run an algorithm through it. And then it can show individual neurons. And we're going to see a picture of this in a little bit later in one of the other slides, and it's called diffuse tensor, tensor imaging. And that lets us know, like at a more individual level, which pathways in the brain have been affected. It's used a lot in research, and unfortunately, it's just now like starting to gain traction, 
as far as being utilized for people that have had a brain injury. And arguably, if you've had a concussion, your MRI may look clean, but your diffuse tensor imaging is probably gonna show more than an MRI, right? But unfortunately, it's not being used that much. I don't believe that insurance really covers it, but it's a powerful tool and hopefully it's coming down the pipeline. But we talked a little bit about, um, about imaging, right, and structure, but let's talk a little bit about function, okay? And that's where your symptoms are gonna come in because we can have structural issues with the brain, right? They show up on the MRI, but then we can have a concussion where it doesn't show up on the MRI. It's like microstructural damage to the brain. So then how would you figure out how to treat a concussion, which we're gonna get into a little bit later, right? If you can't really see it on the MRI, because a lot of times medicine is relying on imaging, which is great, but we can't always rely on it. Then we need to look at function. And to be honest with you, structure is gonna dictate function, but the way the brain works, which we'll talk a little bit about, and Dr. Ellis spoke about in our last, um, our, our last uh, presentation, was that the brain is an integrated network, right? So you could have an injury to your frontal lobe and it has an effect on your cerebellum, but your cerebellum looks beautiful on, on imaging, All right? So when we, not, when we wanna start thinking about function, one of the first things we're gonna think about is what symptoms does a patient have, All right? So common symptoms of brain injury, we've got headache, fatigue, seizure, nausea, poor sleep, trouble walking, right? Those fall under the physical categories. We have two lines of physical categories because there's a lot. Uh, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity. Sensitivities to sensations in general can be a big thing, but fortunately, we can also use people's sensations to help treat them. So, and eventually, we may have a reduction or an elimination of those light and sound sensitivities. We may so also have spasticity, visual issues, like I talked about before, balance, swallowing. Notice how balance keeps coming up? That's why we're talking about balance tonight. There's cognitive issues, there's emotional and behavioral issues. I'm not gonna read the whole list, but you guys can see it on your computer and for those people here, you can see it up on the screen. And then I'm not progressing. Can we click the PowerPoint? There we go. So how is a brain injury typically treated? Like I said, we're most likely gonna start out at the emergency department good place to start, right? Because you're gonna get life-saving care there. Then once they stabilize you in the emergency room, right? And they get you at, to the point where your baseline systems, right? Are online, you're breathing on your own, right? So maybe you had a loss of consciousness. Maybe it was a some more, uh, more severe brain injury, right? Than, than say a concussion, right? Where you had a loss of consciousness, right? They're gonna make sure that you're conscious, that you're breathing, that you can feed yourself um, you're either toileting on your own, right? Or they have ways for you to evacuate your bladder and bowel. And then you're gonna move on eventually to outpatient care, right? And with outpatient care, you're gonna be working with neurologists, psychologists, orthopedists, right? You're gonna be doing different types of therapy, whether it's PT, OT, speech, right? There's also a respiratory therapy. And one that doesn't get talked about as much um, I think a lot of people are probably familiar with these other types of therapies is vo vocational rehab, right? And that's meant to get you back to your job and teach you how to interact in the world, right? On a regular basis. So all these things can be done in outpatient care. Oftentimes people will start with this in the hospital as well, but they're trying to graduate you to outpatient care, which is what we fall under. Outpatient meaning that you're not, you know, spending the night in the place that you're also getting treatment essentially. Right? You're not sleeping there. And then what's going to dictate you know, how far you can go? There's a few different factors with it. Um, unfortunately, the way we used to think about a brain injury is you had like six months, a year. There were kind of some rough estimates, but oftentimes it was six months to a year. You're going to get better, and then what you got is what you got, and that's all you got. Right? And what factors are gonna help you get better in that year's time to get you to your maximum level of improvement or what's called maximum medical improvement is the therapies that you do. So it's really important to do these things up front. A lot of the brain changes do happen up front in those earlier times, 
So it's, it's important to be as aggressive as you can with those therapies to the level that you can do it, right? But the misnomer is that after a year, you're done. The vast majority of the patients that we see, it's been months or years, right? And we're gonna talk a little bit, in a little bit about a patient that I saw, it was nine years after her injury and we were making improvements. So it's not stated that way as much but there's time and time again where I go to gatherings with people in the brain injury community and I've been to talks that they've been to and it's still perseverated, right, throughout healthcare that you've got six months to a year and that's all you get as far as your improvement. And the truth is, is that's a lie. It's not, it's ignorant at this point. It's not the truth. And we need to understand that your brain can change at any point. It's going to be easier in six to 12 months, but it can change at any point. I spent a lot of time on that, but I think it's a really important point. And I've seen a lot of frustration in people's eyes when they step up in front of a room and they're brain injured. And they're like, why did people tell me this? And it's messed up. So this is a patient that I worked with. Um, she was nine injuries post, or sorry, nine years post brain injury, right? So let me pause that for a second. So she has some issues with walking, right? And gait. And you can see maybe in kind of the, the bottom corner that, um, that she's got an orthotic on her foot, right? So one of her big things was she wanted to be able to balance better and walk more independently on her own. So what I'm looking at here with her is I'm looking at how well can she flex back her knee, right? So if this is my knee, this is extension, this is flexion, right? So how well can she flex it back and pull it back towards herself? Because that's gonna be a part of walking. And you can see she's got pretty limited motion. So I want you to just take a second and look at how much motion she's got. That's why this is on repeat. It's not much. Okay, so we'll move on from there. All right, so what did we do about it? Look, look at it one more time. Look at how much motion she's got. So now we're gonna look at what we did to help her. So I'm telling her, hey, this is your baseline. This is where you're at. This is, doesn't mean that this is where you're gonna be. Okay, so then I do what's called mirror therapy, and we're gonna talk about what mirror therapy is, right? And I'm practicing moving her leg. She's moving her leg that you can see, and then behind that mirror is her other leg, and I'm assisting her, because her left leg moves better than her right, okay? But we're trying to get that right leg to move better. I do that, and I rub her leg a little bit, and look at how much further that moves. Then I do a little bit of complex movements with her leg, staring, uh, stimulating a few areas of her brain, in particular one called the cerebellum that helps coordinate movements. Then I don't even need to do the little tissue pull thing I did on her, and I just tell her to do it, and she can pull it back. Okay? I don't know if you heard that, but that's, she said that's the furthest it's ever gone. Not, Not all cases, cases work out like this. This, this is, is a nice, nice one, but that was about 15 minutes worth of work. 15 minutes worth of work. Nine, Nine years later, later, one year into it, you're done. Right? That's a bunch of crap. So, sorry. Um, <laughs> like I said, we're going to keep it light tonight. We're going to keep it light. So. <laughs> but anyway, this is diffuse tensor imaging. Okay? So you can see these little strands in here. Um, anybody who's been in our office, you're gonna see a lot of artwork on the walls, right? Because we're obsessed with brains. Um, and this is, I believe, one of the pieces that we have, right? Or at least a very similar version to it. But you can see the ind individual strands, right, that make up those pathways in the brain. Right, so how do we do care differently? How do we spend 15 minutes with someone like that and then, then they can all of a sudden, you know, flex at the knee better, okay? so. 
Our in-depth knowledge of how information travels through the brain allows us to figure out your brain function challenges and then in a turn the root cause of your issues. So with her, she was in a car accident. She had a traumatic brain injury um, and part of her also hitting her head, she also had a stroke. So she had a lot going on. Um, so by knowing the pathways that were working in her brain, I was able to accelerate things and make things move a little bit quicker. That's part of why it only took 15 minutes, right, to get the, uh, to, get to the root of her issues, right? So then as far as on the treatment side of things, we're going to pool the collective knowledge, right, of contemporary research and therapy applications from several professions. So the reason why people come to see us, and it's nine or ten years later, and they've kind of given up on PT at, at, at some point, potentially, or occupational therapy, right, and they feel like they've gone as far as they can with that, is the fact that we look at cutting-edge research, right? You're going to see it on, in another slide later, but it takes 17 years for contemporary research to stand a chance, not guaranteed, but to stand a chance to get into clinical practice. There was a study on this. So what's cutting edge in standardized practice right now is 17 years old. Does anybody want to do 17-year-old rehab? I want to do the stuff that's cutting edge, right? So we use contemporary research, and then we use therapy app applications from several other professions. We're not afraid to steal ideas from others, right? Because it's going to help our patients. And then we're going to combine the right therapies to reconnect your brain networks. So let's talk about what that's like, right, as far as recombining those areas. So let's talk about this a little bit differently. Does anybody here, is anybody here old enough to remember what Google Maps was or is? Or it still exists, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm all about Google Maps, I guess, even though I have an iPhone. Um, but I learned to not trust Google Maps very quickly, and I have a, an extreme bias. So does anybody, let me put it differently, does anybody remember the launch of Google Maps? It was horrendous. I wound up 30, 40 miles from here at a Walmart that didn't exist, and it was a gas station, right? And that's what Google Maps told me. So the issue is, is that your trip that you're taking is only as good as your maps. So I learned very early not to trust Google, or sorry, not to trust Apple Maps, Apple Maps. So I'm a Google Maps guy. Um, yeah, maybe I said it wrong. Maybe I said it wrong. But yeah, Apple Maps was, was a disaster when it first came out. Um, it eventually got better, but I still trust Google Maps more. So the thing with your health is your health is only as good as your maps. So the way your brain works is it takes in input from your environment. And Dr. Ellis talked about this a little bit last time when he spoke. It takes in information from your environment, right? Sensations. And we're going to talk about some sensations tonight. But there's your five typical sensations and then a, a couple others that we're going to talk about. And then it creates a representation of your world, right? Yourself, and then how you compare to your world, right? And these are some maps that you can see on the PowerPoint that are in your brain. And different parts of your body need better representation. The face is really well represented on here because we need more input about our face than we do, say, our large tail. And then what happens is sometimes we get damage to the brain and then we get damage to the maps in our brain. We don't know where we are in our world. We don't know where the world is relative to us. So our brain doesn't know how to react to the world. And then we lose function and we're stuck with symptoms. Does that kind of make sense? So the way the maps are created in your brain is it's by areas of the brain and then networks that interact with each other, right? So it's teams. Oftentimes we'll talk about, hey, this is a frontal lobe activity, which is partially true, right? It's a network of areas that fire together. And that's what Dr. Ellis focused on a lot last time, but I wanted to touch on it this time as well. So as far as at GCNC, when we're examining you, we do things a little bit differently. Um, Sometimes you need a 15 minute appointment. Sometimes, you know, you got a head cold, you've got mucus that's kind of brown, right? And maybe you want some antibiotics if they're gonna work. You go to the, you go to the doctor, they spend 15 minutes with you, you get some antibiotics to get over your cold, right? You get rid of that infection. That makes sense. 
If you've had a brain injury, you probably want longer than a 15 minute appointment. So our, our exam is three hours, right? Which sounds like a lot, but we get a lot done in that amount of time. So we're gonna do an in-depth history and a review of records. We're gonna look at your vitals, right? Your heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen levels. And that's, that's gonna be somebody, something that's typically done at a cardiologist's office. And like I said, as far as the in-depth history and the records review, it's a little bit of a lost art, right? We have a huge intake form. Um, it takes a while to fill out. And then we'll oftentimes have conversations with people because that's how we start to figure out which areas of your brain need help and which ones don't. And time after time, again, people come in and they're like, you're the first doctor that's listened to me. All right, the first doctor that's listened to me. So as soon as you start talking to us or you fill out your history form, we're already thinking about you, wondering what we can do to help you and starting to figure out which areas your brain need help. We're doing vitals, right, as far as heart rate, blood pressure, and oxygen, but we're doing it in different positions, right? Because whether you're standing or lying can mean different things. Your heart rate and blood pressure should change, but if there's too much of a drastic change, you've got something going on with your brain function. So I'm just letting you guys know all the different areas that we're getting ideas from, because when you layer in these multiple disciplines, like I talked about, that's when you tend to get better results. We work in you know, fields of specialty, and sometimes that's important, but at times you need to do a holistic look at what's going on. We also do eye movement testing, right? And eyes are a really big window into brain function, not only based on vision, but on how your eyes move. Right? Typically, you'll get that in an ENT in a vision therapy office. Right? There's also balance assessment, which you typically get at physical therapy, and we're going to go over that today. There's a cognitive assessment. That's neuropsychology. Right? And then there's an examination that is as in-depth, if not more, oftentimes when I'm told by patients, more in-depth than you're going to get in a, in a typical neurologist's office. Right? And we're looking at the different areas of the brains and the networks. They have different jobs to do. So if I tap on someone's knee, that lets me know if a certain area or a certain network in your brain is doing its job or not. Does that knee kick out? How hard does it kick? Right? Does it not kick at all? There is a sweet spot. It's like Goldilocks. We want that sweet spot as far as how much that knee kicks. It tells us a lot of information about certain areas of your brain. So once we gather some of that information, we can talk about treatment. But before we do that, let's talk about how we test your balance. So I talked about how fall risk is a big thing with TBI, okay? Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a big thing as well, like I said, about which areas of your brain are functioning and which ones aren't, specifically at a systems level. So there's three different sensations that we're really looking at with this. There's the five stereotypical senses, you know, taste, touch, smell. Um, so some additional ones are visual, right? Proprioceptive and vestibular. The two that some people may not have heard of is proprioceptive and vestibular. But let's talk about visual. So no, not only what you see, but how stable are your cameras? Because your eyes are like cameras. So if your eyes are moving back and forth, you may see double like this hand up here, okay? You may see double. And I apologize if that's a little rough to look at. Um, that's a pretty good example of what double vision can look like, and it, it may make you a little nauseous just looking at it. Um, and then there's also proprioceptive. So this one's a little bit tougher to, to comprehend, but it's joint and muscle feedback, right? It's a, it may be a new idea for, for some people. So the, it's the sense of relative position of neighboring parts of the body and the strength and effort it takes to move them. So we get feedback from our joints and muscles. Are we standing? Are we moving, right? How much are we fighting against gravity? How tall are we standing? Okay, and that's gonna be measured with balance. And then there's also vestibular, which is your inner ear processing or like your balance center, right? Stereotypically, it's known as your balance center. And that's gonna be your orientation of where your head is in gravity. It lets us know where we are relative to gravity. Am I tilted, right? Am I turning? Am I stationary? If your inner ear processing or your vestibular processing is off, you may feel like you're moving when you're not. And that's very common with people that have had a brain injury, whether it's non-traumatic or traumatic. So what does it look like if you've had 
visual issues, right? What kind of symptoms might you have? You might have neck pain or tightness. You might have blurred vision, okay? You might have dizziness. You might have visual discomfort where some certain environments are patterns. You might have nausea. If you're somebody that has proprioceptive issues, you might have poor sensation in your feet, clumsiness, dizziness, poor balance, nausea. If you've got vestibular issues, you may have dizziness issues, poor spatial awareness, poor sense of direction, poor balance, nausea. Right? You can see some overlap between these systems, and oftentimes patients have more than just one. But if you're having these sensations, right, or you're having these symptoms, you may have visual issues, or you may have proprioceptive issues, or you may have vestibular issues, or you may have a combination, right? So, hold on one sec, sorry. Yeah. Let's talk about how we look at these these different systems with balance so that I know how to treat those people better. And then let's talk about some people that had some real issues with this. Okay. So as far as vision, the way we're going to check vision with balance is you're just standing on a plate, right? We have a very fancy piece of equipment. If I go back a few slides, this is our virtual reality balance assessment tool, right? That gives us specific numbers and measurements as far as how good these different systems are, okay? But I'm just demonstrating here in these photos what we're doing with those people, right? I'm talking about it from a generalized standpoint, not necessarily exactly how we do it with virtual reality, but it's a lot easier to understand it from a more basic standpoint. So let's talk about it at the more basic level than the even higher level that we go to with our equipment. So if my, I have my eyes open, I'm using inner ear input. I'm getting information from joints and muscles. I'm getting visual input. But the vast majority of what's keeping me upright and giving me good balance is my vision. But what happens when you take it away and you close your eyes and you're, not, and you're standing on a flat surface? Sometimes for some people, that's enough to throw them off. Okay? All you're left with is vestibular inner ear processing and, visual, sorry, and uh, proprioceptive input. But what's going to dominate the conversation with your brain then is going to be you're going to get more feedback from your joints and muscles. So we say if people really struggle with that, then they're having an issue with their proprioceptive feedback. Their joint muscles not, may not know where they are in space, and it's lying to your brain and telling you you're moving when you're not or you're in a position that you're not really in. Then we'll put people on a foam pad, and we'll have them do eyes open. And then when they do eyes closed on that foam pad, you can't use your vision. It messes up the joint muscle information from your feet and ankles, right? And then all you can rely on is inner ear processing. Does it seem like that's going to be the hardest one? Yeah, that's going to be the hardest one, right? You shouldn't have as good a score when you're on a foam pad, but we're comparing you to data, normative data, meaning comparing you to statistics that have been taken for people in your relative age range, and we see how good you are compared to the average person. And we shouldn't see too much of a drop off in your balance when you're on a foam pad with your eyes closed. Ideally, you can stand on there solid, right? Some wavering, but we don't need to catch you, all right? But if that's your toughest one, you got the lowest relative score with that, then you've got a vestibular processing issue. But honestly, there's some people that just can't really do any of it. Maybe they can do eyes open, but as soon as they close their eyes in any of the conditions, they go down. And I should clarify, by going down, I mean we catch them, all right? No one's allowed to fall in the clinic. No one has ever fallen, and no one ever will. So let's talk about real people. Visual issues, right? So let's say somebody, they right off the bat just couldn't stand there still visually. It was just really tough, and they were constantly wavering. So I had a patient um, with, neck, with neck pain and migraines and a history of concussion and brain surgery. I've actually had a few patients with a similar scenario with this. Um, and one of, the, one of the issues one of these patients had was that their eyes kept shifting back and forth, right? Their cameras were not stable, okay? So with their cameras not being stable, how do they stand a chance at being stable in their world, right? So what we had to do is we did what, what are called gaze stability exercises, which was one of the big things we did with them, was we had them look at a target and practice keeping their eyes on the target while moving their head, and it helped stabilize their, their eyes so they didn't shift back and forth 
and then all of a sudden their neck's feeling better, right? His traumatic brain injury was, I think, in the 80s. I started working with him like three or four months ago, and he's getting better, okay? His, hit, his surgery that he had, I think that was like five or six years ago, he's getting better, right? So it's never too late. So he's getting less neck pain. His migraines are, are better under control, right? He's getting better, and it's that far out, which is huge. It's huge. So proprioception. Let's talk about proprioceptive patient. So they had balance and dizziness issues that led to falls. After he had, saw, he had seen somebody else, and they did therapy on his neck because he was, having, he was having some minor neck pain issues, they were working on his neck, and it actually jacked up his neck. And then the joint muscle input from his neck actually made him worse to the point where he is dizzy. He was nauseous, stumbling all over the place, couldn't get himself to the bathroom. This was a big deal for him, okay? What did we wind up doing for that? We wound up doing rehab on his neck, right? And it, he got better. But we realized that because we checked his proprioception, and we realized that it was off. There's other patients. There's another patient that could be considered to have proprioceptive deficits where he doesn't, he doesn't have good connection between his legs and his brain. And we'll do electrical stimulation and we'll do movements with his feet and ankles. And his gait and the way he walks is getting way better. And this is an individual that's like in his 70s or 80s, which, you know, falls are a big deal for him. So let's talk about vestibular issues. I once had a mother that was having severe dizziness issues. And it was to the point where she'd get these attacks, right? Her inner ear processing was off. She would get these attacks where she was incapacitated. And she was terrified that she was going to drop her child. And she was pregnant with her second child. So it was really scary for her. It was really scary for her. Because the last thing she wanted to do was have one of these vestibular attacks, one of these inner ear processing attacks of vertigo and dizziness because she didn't know where she was in her world and drop her child, right? So that, that weighed on her heavily. So what we did with her is we did what's called vestibular rehab. She looked at the dot as well. That's a type of vestibular rehab. I did some maneuvers with her to recalibrate how her inner ear processing and her neck processing, her proprioception and her neck combined together because she did have some proprioceptive issues as well, but she had a lot of inner ear processing issues. And over time, we were able to recalibrate things for her where she doesn't get those dizziness spells anymore, right? It took some time, but, you know, after years of dealing with it, it got better. And she, you know, her, her kids, I think the one is like eight now and the other one's like five or maybe six. She doesn't drop them. It's huge. It's huge. It, it affects the lives of her children, too, because she can be the mother that she wants to be for them. Um, so what allows us to do these things? Let's, let's get a, a little bit into the nitty-gritty. There's the concept of, uh, of neuroplasticity. Uh, did anybody have any questions up to this point, though, in the chat? We'll do it at the end? Okay. I just wanted to check in case there was anything urgent. Yeah, we can talk about that. So there's, what's that? Yes, yes. So there's times when somebody's going to look at a dot and they're going to move their head. And then there's times where we don't want them to do that and we want to move their head, right? And part of that is going to be how well can you do this? This seems really simple, but there's some people who are like, okay, look at the dot and rotate your head. And, and they're a little bit wobbly, right? Maybe it's not like that. But they're, they're kind of going like this, right? Because they're tilting their head because their view of the world is skewed, right? So we got to get that thing upright. We got to do some therapies with them as well to get it to where they just don't tilt their head. But early on, we may have to do the therapy for them to keep them on plane. There's also times when patients like to do it really fast. Um, some therapists do it really fast but we find that we get better results with less dizziness when we do it at the speed that people can really keep their eyes on target and they're making minimal errors with it. 
and that's part of why we do it sometimes and we don't let the patients do it is because we want them to make minimal errors with it because the better they can stay on that target, right, then the better results we're going to get because they're using good form. There's a, there's a saying, I think it was Vince Lombardi um, said it, that practice doesn't make, per, uh, what is it? Practice doesn't make perfect, perfect practice makes perfect, right? So whatever you practice, you're going to get really good at. So if they do it the wrong way, it could rewire their brain in the wrong way and make their symptoms get worse. So sometimes we got to take the wheel. It's very important. So I love home exercises, but they got to be done at the right time. So let's talk about neuroplasticity. So there's this guy, Paul Bakirita, the PhD. He's known as the father of sensory substitution, right? So this um, device that you see up there, it's a camera that's taking a picture of something in her environment and then it vibrates her chair and she can't see, but with the way that it vibrates, it's rewiring her brain where she can get some semblance of what's in front of her. He created different sensory stimuli devices that allowed blind people to see. Maybe not to the point where they could make out details on somebody's face, right? And have three people in the room and be like, oh, that's that person just by looking at them. But they could sense motion. They could move around objects. It was incredible stuff. So he's known as the, the father of sensory substitution, as some people call him. But why he's important with, with neuroplasticity is not necessarily initially from the work that he did. His brother worked with his dad. And his dad had had a stroke. And he was a college professor. And he had trouble moving. He had trouble speaking. He had trouble doing a lot of things. And his brother basically took his dad and made up a kind of a recipe of different movement and sensory-based exercises. He had him crawling on the floor. He had him scooping up because he couldn't really use his hand well, but he had him scooping up pennies and coins, right? And he made him go through these basic movements until those got really refined, and then he gave him more and more challenging movements to do, and he rewired his brain. He went back to teaching, right? Eventually, he did pass away, and then they dissected his brain, and the areas of his brain that were involved with movement were completely destroyed. But he had rewired his brain through this concept of neuroplasticity, meaning that your brain can change and adapt. So this is really cool stuff. It's something that's really well established in the literature, but it's not something that's executed at kind of a high level in therapy, right? And we need more of that. That's what we're trying to do here, but a lot of people talk about neuroplasticity, but they don't necessarily utilize it in their practice, but we do that every day. So let's talk about another concept called mirror neurons, right? We had that woman, she had the mirror in front of her, one leg on one side, one leg on the other, She's looking in the mirror, pretending that her right leg is the one in the mirror, right? And that other limb behind the mirror, that's just some thing. When she's looking in the mirror, all that matters is the leg that she sees in that reflection, okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But there were some scientists where they were looking at, they were working with monkeys. And supposedly this was a bit of an incidental finding, um, but... When they were, they were looking at the monkeys, they were, uh, they were giving them different activities to do and then measuring areas of their brain activity to figure out which areas of their brain were involved with, say, you know, reaching out, grabbing a banana and eating it. Well, what they found was when they were off in the corner, supposedly this is how it goes, but when they were off in the corner, one of them like ate a banana, picked up, ate a banana, and then the same areas in the monkey's brain fired as if the monkey was picking up the banana and eating it. So just by watching someone else do something, those same areas in your brain fire as if they're doing the movement. And those are called mirror neurons. So there was another guy, uh, V.S. Ramachandran, that developed a theory that's called mirror box ther therapy. So you can see, um, and he's the one that's on the right, um, the older gentleman. Um, and then there's an example of it underneath on the PowerPoint as well, of a woman. So her limb is hidden behind that box, right? And then she can see her reflection. For her, she's got her right arm, and then she's seeing her right arm reflected in there, so we're pretending that's her left arm. 
And when we do this type of therapy with patients, the thing in the box doesn't exist. It's this is your right arm, or this is your right arm, and looking in the mirror, that's your left arm. And we only refer to, to your left arm as being the thing in the mirror because we want to trick the brain into realizing that it can connect with that limb. Okay? So that's kind of the foundational side of mirror neuron therapy. Does anybody have any questions with that? Right? So we can look at something, an activity, in the same areas of your brain fire as if you're doing it. And then we get to another revolutionary, and this is in our field known as chiropractic or functional neurology. This is our, our founder of our, our subspecialty in chiropractor, the founder of, of chiropractic or functional neurology, Professor uh, Frederick or Ted Carrick. And uh, he's, he's done a lot. He was the person that I learned mirror therapy from. Right, I had first seen him utilize it. So, and he's the one that taught, uh, taught us to look to other disciplines, to look at what's in the research base, and to take what's valuable from those, and then combine it together. And when we combine it together, and we do it with the highest level of specificity possible, with constant observation of what we're doing and what effect it has on people, we get way better results, right? So he did an interesting study where it was in 2016 where he looked at brain function and eye movement. And one group in this study just took aspirin, okay, and didn't do eye movement therapy. And then the other group did eye movement therapy, and they had changes in brain function in areas associated with cognitive and motor function, which is pretty crazy because they were just moving their eyes, right? So that's one of the reasons why we do a lot of eye movement therapies, right? is because the brain can rewire itself just by doing eye movement therapies. And this is one of those therapies. I don't know if you can see it because it's moving pretty darn slow, but there's this dot that's jumping across the screen right now. And this is along the lines of what he did with those patients, is they watch this dot jump across the screen and then it's gonna slide back. And this activates different areas of your brain. In particular, we talk a lot about how it activates the frontal lobe, the basal ganglia, right, the cerebellum, right? And the frontal lobe's involved with cognitive functions, so is the cerebellum and the, and the basal ganglia. These are all a network that work together to create these cognitive and movement functions, right? So we can rewire your brain with doing these eye movement exercises. Vision therapy is not just for people that have double vision. It's for people that have cognitive issues. It's for people that have balance issues. Sometimes it's for people that have emotional challenges. It's huge. Um, so let's look at it again. Nine years out. Now we have a better understanding of why we're doing these weird things, right? That's one of the challenges. That's maybe why you're tuning in is because we do weird things here, right? We do things a little bit differently. We'll whip out a mirror off the wall, right? And put it in between you. And you're gonna look at your leg. And then all of a sudden you can move your leg. It's crazy, right? But it's based on research. We're not waiting 17 years. We're being judicious and we're picking the research and we're looking at the things that stand a high likelihood of making a positive change. But we do our intervention and you'll see me do my intervention. Then I say, all right, move your leg. And if she moved her leg, then this is probably an exercise I want to do with her, right? That's probably a positive thing. And then the idea is that we can collaborate with others too. She can move her leg now. So she can work with a physical therapist and she can strengthen that range of motion, right? It's huge. She also did some of those eye movement exercises that I just described to you as well. It wasn't just the mirror, all right? That, I for, should have mentioned that earlier, but it wasn't just the mirror. So these little sensory and movement-based exercises can make huge changes in people's lives, okay? Not falling and hitting your head and getting re-injured is life-changing. So once again, how are we different? Let's talk about it in a different way. Our in-depth knowledge of how information travels through the brain allows us to figure out your brain function challenges and the root causes of your issues. We said that earlier, but it's worth repeating, right? And we pool the collective knowledge of contemporary research 
right? I talked about that study. It takes 17 years for research to get a shot at, and this is on average, right? So there's times when it takes even longer and there's times when it just doesn't happen. 17 years for scientific literature to get into clinical use, right? We're doing it at a faster rate, arguably. And that's part of why we get such good results. And then we're taking therapy applications of several professions. We do tenants of physical therapy. We do tenants are pieces of vision therapy. But when you com combine these things and you don't, don't do them in isolation, because we might do some eye movement therapies and prime a system or prime a network and then do some cognitive therapies and it's going to fire into similar areas of the brain and it's going to have a collective effect where it's going to be exponential results. So doing this is not necessarily the same as doing OT on Monday, PT on Tuesday, and speech on Thursday, right? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. There's great results that are done with that. But when you take tenants of all these, the sum is greater than its parts, right? The sum is greater than its parts. So we combine all those right therapies to reconnect your brain networks. So one of the key elements as well, I mentioned at the beginning that I interned with Dr. Ellis for 14 years, or sorry, in 2014, not for 14 years, fortunately. I got to be a doctor uh, sooner than that. But uh, in 2014, uh, you know, and we're, we're in 2024, it's hard to believe it's been 10 years, right? But I interned with him, um, and then I took some jobs at some other clinics. There were some great opportunities, you know, and uh, the other clinics that I went to, we had great teams of people. Right? But one of the things that, that drew me back here is I wanted to collaborate with people. And this is a strong part of our office, right? is that we have multiple practitioners. We all have the same foundational training, right? but each of us have a little bit of specialty in certain areas. Right? I collaborate a lot with, with Dr. Balf. Right? He's the one that's above uh, the Georgia Chiropractic Neurology emblem right? I collaborate a lot with everyone, right? But sometimes I'll have patients where they, they've had a head injury, they have some vestibular and proprioceptive challenges, and they have some emotional challenges as well. And Dr. Balt does really good with emotional challenges. Dr. Owens does great cranial work. You know, sometimes we get Dr. Ellis involved. Everybody pitches in here, right? You're not just working with one practitioner in isolation. It's a huge thing. It's, it's a rare thing in our profession, right? And I'm talking about my profession in chiropractic or functional neurology. A lot of people are, independent, are independently working, but I think there's value in working with teams because we talk about what we can do better for our patients and we learn from each other. And that's one of the biggest values that I think that we offer at, at, at Georgia Chiropractic Neurology is that we collaborate at a high, high level. And I'm really excited because we're supposed to get an eighth doctor and then we can do the Brady Bunch thing on the website. So, um, and I was very purposeful. You know, I, I put Dr. Ellis at the bottom as our father. So, and then, yeah, you're, you're Carol. So, yeah, you guys are, are kind of in charge of, of all us kids. So, but, um, but yeah, uh, in summation, we do things a little bit differently. We combine different things. Right? We pay attention really closely, meaning that we'll check something. Maybe we check your eye movements. Do an exercise, recheck them. That works better. We're going to do that exercise and we do it with repetition. And then people get better faster. So, all right, I got a, a couple of questions from the chat. And then if you guys have any more questions or if anybody in the room has questions, you know, fire away. Um, but the first question we got from the chat, is autism considered an acquired brain injury? Oftentimes, I would say that autism is considered a brain injury that happens before birth to a certain extent. Like, it, a lot of it is considered to be genetic, right? There's multiple factors at play with autism. Some people, it seems like, are developing pretty well, and then the autism the aspects, you know, the symptoms and the, and the behaviors come out a little bit later in their life. Maybe we don't really see it till one or two or three. It can't really be diagnosed 
right, for a little while. It's not like it's diagnosed at birth. Um, so oftentimes it's, it's not considered an acquired brain injury. Sometimes it happens a little bit later, but it's typically thought of as a brain, as a issue with your, your brain function or a challenge with your brain function that occurs before you're born. So it wouldn't technically be an acquired brain injury. And then do, can TBIs influence a person's perception of reality? It does. It's going to shift your perception of reality. And it's, it's interesting because their actions and how they perceive the world is 100% accurate to their perception of the world based on how their brain processes the world and the sensations that it creates around them. So to say that a little bit differently, I might be, you know, I, I might be fine one day and then I have a head injury and then I walk in this room and then all of a sudden the lights are too bright, right? And I hear multiple things going on and I start to get a headache and there's just too many things going on and I get overwhelmed and then I get anxious, right? And this is a very scary environment, even though there's just like three people working at different stations in this big room that we have doing some therapies and everybody's happy and excited. This can turn into a very scary place if you've got light sensitivity, if you've got sound sensitivity. And it's, a, it's very appropriate to how your brain interprets the world, right? So we need to rewire these people's brains so that they're, they can process the light, they can process the sound, and it's not overwhelming, right? Then their world is a safer place and they're gonna have less symptoms, right? And they're gonna feel more secure in their environment and they're not gonna have as much anxiety. Because if you're dealing with all that stuff, I'd think something was wrong with you if you didn't have anxiety, right? In an environment like that. And if you have a kid with special needs, I know somebody brought up autism, like some of the things that I've mentioned tonight might speak to you on that. A lot, if, you're, if you've got a child that is living on the autistic spectrum and they're a bit older, you're probably aware of vestibular processing. You're probably, probably aware of proprioceptor processing. And what I've talked about before is there's kids that also have sensory processing issues where all these sensations are overwhelming for them. All of our patients have sensory processing issues, not just kids. The adults that have had a brain injury, sometimes they don't really know where it came from. Right? Everybody that comes through our door, they're not processing information from their environment appropriately. And we need to get that back on track. It's not just kids living on the autistic spectrum or kids with sensory processing disorder. It's, it's people that have had a brain injury as well. And then, was there another one? Was there, how do you define traumatic brain injury? Was that one or was there one before that? Trauma brain? Yeah, I saw, I can see it on my end too. Trauma brain, I'm not sure. Um, is anybody else, any of the other docs in the room familiar with that term? I mean, there's a traumatic brain injury, and maybe you can clarify that a little bit as far as what your understanding of trauma brain is. I could see it maybe from like a traumatic emotional standpoint as well. Maybe the, the trauma of having that brain injury I could see that, but I'm not sure what trauma brain means exactly. So I, don't, I can't really answer that question. I apologize. But I'll look into it, and I'll try and get back to you. Any other questions? Does anybody in the room have a question? I know we have some students in here tonight, which I really appreciate, and this was probably a little bit um, basic for you, right? But, uh, you know, these are important things that I would argue that the public needs to know. Uh, Anybody else? I see that after 75, yeah. the incidence goes up, right? And I had heard as young as like 55, like people falling, et cetera. Yeah, so the, was that it? Yeah, I mean, could you just expand on that? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. It, so the question was, is, you know, 75 and above, I said like that's, that's when, you know, the incidence goes up. That's the highest at-risk population. When I was looking at different statistics, and I apologize if I didn't put my source in there, I'll make sure it gets in there, and the next time I give this talk, I'll have it in there. But my source on that um, was saying that it was 75, but I looked at some other sources, and they were saying 65. Some said less. The source I looked at had 2020 data, so maybe that was more 
and that was more contemporary. So maybe the numbers have shift, shifted based on 2020 data. But I would say, yeah, like you, you could have issues with balance, you know, and fall risk and have issues with hospitalization for traumatic brain injury at all ages. Oh, you know, okay. it's not just limited to that. Yeah, but. So it's not just the balance, but like I, I think the source I had seen, that was like the number one cause of death over a certain age. Balance? Uh, yeah. No, fall from the balance. Fall from, yeah, falls from balance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that number that I found, you could probably easily argue it that it's less. You might be able to argue that it's more. It depends on your source. Not all of this, you know, is solidified in hard numbers. We like to think that science is hard numbers like that, but honestly, there's there's varying opinions. You know, I think we've figured out that out over the last few years um, that there can be variability and difference of opinions in science. But that's also a part of what makes it great because that's the only thing that's going to move us forward, right? So we got to sometimes take the numbers um, with a little bit of a grain of salt, but we need to respect them as well. Obviously, we need to respect them as well. So. Yes. Um, gotcha. Um, so the person replied and said, I've heard it, heard it be used with people who have had emotional trauma from being in narcissistic relationships. I mean, there's definitely aspects to emotional trauma, right, that can come up. And it could be from being in a narcissistic relationship. I've worked a lot with kids that have been adopted. And some of those kids were in very traumatic circumstances, right? And based on the environment that you grow up in, right, that's going to rewire your brain. And we're going to have those past experiences to reflect on. And that's going to change the way our brain functions. And we could go into a room that could be empty and quiet and safe. But if it looks like a room exactly like where you had a traumatic event at some point in your life, and for some people it's, you know, it was their brain injury. I had one woman that was like terrified to go down the stairs outside of her apartment because that's where she slipped and fell. So like, how do you, how do you live with that? Because every time she looked at the stairs, even though they were just sitting there, it brought up that trauma for her. So I could see where that, that could be a factor as far as with trauma brain. I'm not that familiar with it. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll look into it more and I could probably get back to you with more information. But that's a new thing for me, which is part of the reason why we want to do these talks because we learn, we learn what's important to everybody and what we need to be looking into. But you work with thousands of people. Right? Yeah, I work with thousands of people that have had trauma. I'm just not familiar with trauma brain. It sounds like it's more from like a... Uh, psychological standpoint, which, you know, goes, goes hand, hand in hand with, with neurology, neurology, but it's, it's just, just not a term I'm familiar, familiar with. with. Yes. Do TBI's physical, physical changes... I have... Sorry, I have the emojis, like, blocking me. Yeah. Can you read that to me? Do TBI's physically change the structure of the brain or just the function? Excellent question. TBI's... Do TBIs physically change the structure of the brain or change the structure of the brain or they, do they just change the function? So I would say both, right? They're going to change the structure and the function, especially when we're talking about moderate to severe TBIs. It's tough to say with concussion because, like I said, oftentimes you look at the MRI and you're not going to see structural changes on there, but it's going to be at a microtrauma level. So I would say that there's some kind of structural trauma there. It's just maybe more easily repaired. Like diffuse injury. Yeah, than a diffuse axonal injury where there's been major shearing forces. And you look at the MRI and it's like, yeah, within like two seconds, you're like, yeah, that, that was a brain injury, right? So you're gonna get a little bit of both. It's just, it's, it can be more challenging working with someone with a concussion because the imaging is not really gonna tell you much because that trauma is so small. Uh, we got another question here. Um, when you, can you speak a little bit to your experience with working with these children with adoption? And like, did you work specifically with like the emotions affiliated with them? Or was it more so like you did your typical, um, like 
different functional neurology treatments with them and then hope that it would indirectly affect more emotional well-being? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question was, is um, when I was working with, when, when I have worked with and I do work with these children that have been adopted, that have been in these traumatic circumstances, right, do I, how do I approach that? Do I do work that's more specifically targeted to emotional work or do I ne do neuro rehab work that's more targeted towards the functionality of their brain? It's arguably a little bit of a combination of both. My specialty, I tend to err more on the side of doing the neurological work to get them to a state where their brain won't get stuck in those patterns that can lead them back to those repetitive negative emotions, right? And help them break that. And then I tend to co-manage them. I can co-manage them in this clinic because we have eight doctors with different specialties and some of our other doctors, right, are really good at the emotional work, in particular, Dr. Balf. Um, so we'll co-manage one of those patients together and he can work on the emotional side as well as the neurology, but my focus is gonna be more on that neurological side. But what I found with working with these kids is oftentimes we can make breakthroughs with that, and then the other practitioners that they're working with, whether it be a therapist, or maybe they're working with another chiropractor that does like emotional work, right? We tend to, tend to compound things and get that, those exponential results, right? That we can get here in clinic, but I, you know, some people already have people that they like working with that work locally. And then I also see some patients in another state as well. I work out of Pennsylvania sometimes as well. So, um, but as far as when I'm in Georgia, you know, my, I defer to the people in our office that do that emotional work because it gets really good results. I'd argue you gotta, you gotta address both. You, you've gotta address both in some way, form or fashion. But it's interesting because some of these children have been in extremely traumatic environments. Most of them have had fetal drug and alcohol exposure, although we don't really know what to, to what level. Um, but whether they were adopted at one day old or they were adopted you know, at three or four or six, they have some kind of emotional trauma that's almost inherent to them, which is interesting. Um, even if, like I said, their only experience really with their with their mother was in utero and the birthing process. But there seems to be some kind of inherent trauma that's, that's, that's in there, so. How much does one's diet affect brain function? How much does one's diet? It can affect it. It can affect it. Um, you know, blood sugar levels are a big thing, right? If we're consuming a lot of processed carbohydrates, that's the first thing that we go to at the beginning of the day is we, you know, I want to. I want to like Quaker Oats. I like the guy in the box. I like his haircut, but it's not your best choice. You know, you want some protein in the morning, right? You don't want to go to processed carbohydrates. Some are better than others. Don't get me wrong, but you're going to get a pretty big blood sugar spike, and then your insulin is going to absorb all that, get it to your cells, and then you're going to crash, right? So we typically talk with our patients that are working with us, like, yeah, diet matters. A, we want you to eat breakfast because there's some people that come in and it's 11.30 in the morning and it's like, hey, what'd you have for breakfast? I didn't have anything. And they're already like crashing. And that's a tough system to work with because the brain needs fuel, which is, is, um, is glucose, right? But we want a slow release, not from processed carbohydrates and proteins right? Those are going to be our building blocks, but we also want oxygen and stimulation, right? And we're trying to do the stimulation part, but if they don't have the fuel for it because they didn't eat breakfast, like they're going to crash. So we want to make sure that our, our patients are eating meals. And if they are eating meals, it, you know, we typically rent, uh, recommend something on like non-processed foods, right? Mostly meat and vegetables and some carbohydrates, but ones that are, take a little bit more work for your body to digest, you know, like a sweet potato, as opposed to um, a candy bar, so or a pop tart, although they're delicious, they're good. Um, any other questions? All right, it is eight eighteen. If nobody has any other questions, then I think maybe we'll we'll call it an evening. I was shooting for an hour, right, or an hour to an hour and a half. I think I ended pretty well with the timing of my. PowerPoint, and we got some questions in, but we really appreciate everyone um, joining us tonight.
but please just know, right? If you've been dealing, can you get me back to the PowerPoint? Sorry, I should have brought this up. Cool. Just know that if you've seen multiple practitioners, right, and you're not making progress, and maybe they told you you got six months to a year to improve, right, you deserve a closer look. You deserve that long intake process because we're going to gain a lot of information from it. But we also do complimentary consultations, right? We like to learn about people and make sure you're in the right place. So those usually, usually take about 15 to 30 minutes for a consultation. And we're going to make sure that we're the right place for you because we don't want to waste anybody's time or money. And if we think that there's other things that you need to do, maybe you need to focus on that nutritional side of things. Then we're going to recommend that. But we love doing consultations with people um, to figure out if we're going to be the right place for you. And oftentimes we are. And then we can go from there. So don't hesitate to reach out if you want one of those complimentary, complimentary consultations so you can learn a little bit more about your brain and how it could be playing a big role in your health. Thank you, everybody, for your time this evening. And thanks for bearing with me with uh, the few complications we had on the technical side of things. So, But we'll see you again in a month. Have a good evening.